The other thing that appears to be sort of happening now, the other unknown at the start of this process that is now becoming known, is what had been a very open question as to how Trump supporters would respond to the arrest and indictment of the former president. You might remember what Trump first said when he announced to the country that he believed he would be indicted and arrested. Do you remember what his first statement was? He had a declarative demand to his supporters. He said, protest, take our nation back. We must save America. Protest, protest, protest. You know what didn't happen? That didn't happen. And that was a couple of weeks ago now when Trump first said that he would be arrested. He demanded that his supporters get out in the streets, that they protest in response to the threat to arrest him. That did not happen. Nobody protested. And, and you could say, OK, maybe that's because Trump was wrong about when he was going to be indicted, when he was going to be arrested. He wasn't, in fact, arrested that Tuesday when he said he was going to be. So maybe that's why the protests didn't emerge. Well, that day that he said he was going to be arrested, in fact, passed without him being indicted or arrested. But then last week, the day happened. <laughs> we learned late in the day on Thursday that Trump had been indicted. And Trump's lawyers confirmed that he had been indicted. And then the DA's office in New York confirmed that he had been indicted. And then we learned that tomorrow, Tuesday, he will be arrested. He will be arraigned. But still, nobody really protested. I mean, a handful of people showed up and waved flags or whatever at Mar-a-Lago, but it wasn't anything that constituted an event by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, we've had headline after headline after headline after headline saying that everybody is, is bracing for mass protest by Trump supporters. But it's not happening. At least thus far, it's not happening. And that itself is an interesting political fact now. That's an interesting political known outcome here. I mean, he specifically called on his supporters to come out and protest on his behalf, to save America, to protest, protest, protest. The New York Times specifically reporting over the weekend on a planned New York City homecoming protest on Trump's behalf at Trump Tower this morning, Monday morning in New York City. Well, whatever the New York Times was expecting in terms of the Trump homecoming protest at Trump Tower, it was like three people. I mean, this was the headline in Politico yesterday. Lone MAGA supporter awaits Trump in New York. And that's not hyperbole. It was a, that whole story was basically a profile on the one guy, the single guy who turned up at Trump Tower to support Trump yesterday. And then today, the big homecoming protest in support of Donald Trump. This was the headline at New York Magazine today. Trump supporters in Manhattan, in Manhattan are outnumbered by reporters. Here's the lead of that story. Quote, one South Brooklyn resident who sells MAGA merchandise and medical software for a living had organized a homecoming for the former president ahead of his arraignment tomorrow. The man was hoping for a strong turnout. Roger Stone, after all, had amplified his rally announcement. But just a handful of supporters actually showed up. I mean, it's one thing for people to not come out and protest in support of you, right? It's one thing for people to not come out and protest in your defense. But when you specifically ask them to, when you in fact command them to, and they don't, what does that say about you? I mean, Trump last year said if any prosecutor indicted him, the United States would have, quote, the biggest protest we have ever had. He said, in Washington, D.C., in New York, in Atlanta, and elsewhere, we are going to have in this country the biggest protest we have ever had. He said in January last year that would be the result of any indictment of him in any of those jurisdictions. In September, he said it again. He was asked if he'd be indicted. He said in response, I think if it happened, I think you'd have problems in this country the like of which perhaps we've never seen before. I don't think the people of the United States would stand for it. Now we know the people of the United States are standing for it, it turns out. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what tomorrow's like. We will see whether there is a, you know, massive millions of people fill the streets pro-Trump protest on the streets of Manhattan tomorrow. Maybe there will be. Who knows? But he asked people to protest, protest, protest in response to news of his indictment. 
And so far, his, his requests, his demands, his certain predictions that Americans would turn to the streets in record numbers on his behalf, numbers never seen before, people protesting against his indictment and protests like we've never seen before in America. So far, his people are not doing what he told them to do and what he confidently said they would do. But who knows? Who knows? We'll see what happens tomorrow. Um, and, and like we have been reporting on this show, like I have been trying to sort of convey in terms of my perception about how this is going to go, there's still lots to come. I mean, this is the start of a legal process, which, if it goes terribly for him, will likely end with him, you know, being fined for something that his lawyer already went to prison for. It's going to take a long time. New York court proceedings always take a long time. New York court proceedings in white collar crime brought by very litigious guys often take forever. It's going to take a long time. And even in the short term, it's going to be a lot of motions. It's going to be a lot of legalese. And it's actually going to mix, be mixed up with a lot of other legal processes. I mean, here we are at the beginning of April. What's Trump's month going to look like? Right? Th this week, he's in New York to be arraigned and arrested tomorrow. Next week, he has to be in New York again to be deposed in the quarter billion dollar civil fraud suit that the New York Attorney General has brought against him and his adult children. The week after that is when the Fox Dominion case is supposed to go to trial. If the disclosures thus far in that trial are anything to go by, that will mean, among other things, lots more headlines about the most influential right wing media figures in the country secretly hating Trump's guts and telling people behind the scenes when nobody's watching how dumb and terrible and wrong Trump is. That'll be a nice week for him. Then the week after that, the E. Jean Carroll case goes to trial in which he's accused of raping E. Jean Carroll and then lying about it. I mean, that's what April looks like in his calendar. That's what the next four weeks are like for him in his calendar. So who knows? Now, maybe one of those things will be a flashpoint. Maybe at some point this month, a million Americans will flood the streets of New York, cheering his name and burning cars or something. But so far, there's no sign of anything like that, despite his confident predictions that that's what his supporters would do. When he does get arraigned tomorrow, mid-afternoon, his indictment will be unsealed by the judge who is overseeing his case. He should know that that judge is also the same judge who's overseeing the Steve Bannon criminal fraud case. That is also the same judge who just oversaw the Trump business criminal fraud case, uh, Trump organization criminal fraud case, which, which ended a few months ago with convictions on all counts. Uh, the judge having a hand in both of those things is, is a good reminder that Trump's indictment doesn't exactly come out of the blue here. His business was just convicted on multiple felony fraud counts. His accountant is a convicted felon who right now is in prison. His campaign chairman is a convicted felon. His deputy campaign chairman is a convicted felon. His longest term political advisor is a convicted felon. His campaign CEO and top White House advisor is right now under felony indictment before the same judge and for the criminal scheme that we believe Trump himself is about to finally be charged for tomorrow. It's not like this came out of the blue. And while we're on the subject of this judge, you should know that the judge who's going to be handling this Trump case not only handled the Trump business fraud case and is not only currently handling the Steve Bannon fraud case, this judge also has the perfect resume for this case in particular, because before he became a judge, do you know what his previous job was? His previous job before he became a judge was working as an auditor at a real estate development firm. <laughs> It is believed that these charges against Trump are about falsification of business records at Trump's real estate development firm. It is a little bit on the nose that falsification of business records at a real estate development firm is a case that's going to be heard before a judge who used to audit business records at a real estate development firm. But that's the way this thing is going. That's the way this month is going for Donald Trump. It's like this case was put together in a lab. I want to update you on an unsettling story we covered a few weeks ago here on the show. You might remember some of this footage that we showed. We heard from a lot of you about it. Um, it's footage from a neo-Nazi rally targeting trans people and drag performance uh, in Ohio. 
And I'm not using the phrase neo-Nazi here as some sort of generic epithet. I mean, that is specifically what we are dealing with here. So we showed you this video on the show uh, a few weeks ago, protesters including dozens of neo-Nazis, uh, some of them conspicuously armed. They're carrying swastika flags. They're shouting Sieg Heil. Um, they were screaming at a drag queen story hour, a family friendly event that was being held in Wadsworth, Ohio. Uh, well, now here's an update. Um, this photo is from a newly released federal criminal complaint. This complaint identifies a 20-year-old man you see at the center of this image uh, as a member of the Ohio chapter of White Lives Matter. Um, this photo shows him at that anti-trans protest that we covered last month. On Friday, this man was arrested and charged in federal court for allegedly trying to firebomb an Ohio church. He is currently in federal custody. According to the FBI and the Justice Department, the man drove to a church more than an hour from his home. He brought with him these Molotov cocktails and a spray bottle filled with gasoline. He then firebombed the church. The church was marked with scorch marks. The FBI says they were able to link him to the attack by tracing the location of his cell phone. According to the criminal complaint in his case, when FBI agents arrived at his home, he admitted to building the Molotov cocktails and to throwing them at the church. They said he told them the reason he did it was to stop a drag show event that was scheduled for the following week at the church. He told them his only regret was that the Molotov cocktails didn't cause more damage. There was nobody inside the church at the time that he attacked it. Nobody was hurt, but you can see there was some damage. The church says they would like to see this young man prosecuted to send a message to other like-minded people. But the church also says they forgive him for what he did. In the end, uh, the church was able to hold that drag story event that they had planned for this past weekend as originally planned. Um, there was a protest about 15 minutes down the road at a related drag event in a neighboring, neighboring town. This one was targeted by a what, white nationalist group called the Patriot Front. That's them across the street there near the gazebo, you can see. The ultra-right, the violent ultra-right, including the neo-Nazi movement in this country, is, for whatever reason, extremely energized right now. And, yeah, we talk a lot about how the very far right, how extremists are connected to electoral politics and the like. But these federal charges for trying to firebomb a church over a drag story hour it really puts an exclamation point on the rise of right-wing extremism and right-wing violence just on its own terms, regardless of what it's connected to. Again, he's been charged in federal court. He's in custody right now. We'll know more later this week when he has his first day in court. Handy rule for watching the news. Uh, it was true then. It's true now. I think it has eternal value. Uh, if you're a longtime watcher of this show, you will know what the rule is, which is watch what they do, not what they say. Uh, and in today's news, we have an excellent example of why that rule is important. As he approaches his arrest and indictment tomorrow, former President Donald Trump has reportedly told associates that he welcomes the spectacle of what's going to happen tomorrow. Specifically, he welcomes the idea of being paraded in front of the cameras for his arraignment. He has reportedly described the proceeding as having the potential to be a, quote, fun experience for him. The New York Times reporting that he has mused aloud about whether or not he should smile for the cameras, smile for his mugshot. His allies are also saying this indictment, this arrest is going to be a big boost for him. It will be great for his campaign. They can't wait to use the footage in all sorts of politically advantageous ways. If you go by what they say, Trump is celebrating his forthcoming arraignment, looking forward to it all being on camera because that will all be so good for him. That's what they've been saying. Well, what are they doing? What they're doing is formally arguing to the judge against cameras being allowed in the courtroom for the arraignment. Trump's lawyers are also now publicly arguing against Trump having to pose for a mugshot. Hey, wait, I thought you were excited about the mugshot. I thought you were excited for the cameras showing the arraignment. That's what they've been saying, but that's completely opposite to what they're doing. 
Meanwhile, today, uh, the Republican governor of Florida made a sort of telling decision um, to do this behind closed doors. Today, Ron DeSantis signed new legislation for Florida, and he did it in this session that was closed to the public. Only the NRA was invited and other pro-gun lobbyists. Nobody else knew about it. But the bill that he signed there with the NRA behind closed doors um, will now make it legal in Florida for anybody to carry a concealed loaded weapon with no permit, no training, no background check, no license. So if you're in Florida and you're breathing, feel free to put a loaded gun in your pants and take it wherever you want. New law signed, in, signed into effect today uh, by Ron DeSantis. Interesting that Governor Ron DeSantis chose to do this signing without the public invited, without anybody even notified in advance that he was doing it. It was just him and the gun lobbyists behind closed doors. At 10.13 a.m. today, 10.13 a.m. exactly, kids in Nashville, Tennessee, all walked out of their classes. Look at that. 10.13 a.m. is when the first Help Me 911 calls started coming into the police department in Nashville one week ago today, Monday last week, when that horrific school shooting started unfolding at the Covenant School, an elementary school in that city. Police today said that in the roughly 14 minutes that it took for that school shooting to elapse, the shooter fired 126 rifle rounds and 26 rounds from a handgun, 152 rounds altogether in 14 minutes. To honor the three little kids and the three school staff who were murdered in their school Monday last week and to demand legal change to stop gun violence. Literally thousands of Tennessee students walked out of their classes today. And at some, at some schools, they, they left their classrooms and they rallied outside their school. That happened at a whole bunch of different schools in Tennessee. Um, at some schools today, they did a walk in instead of a walk out, meaning they left class, but then they came together in a school auditorium to talk about the problem. Uh, but by the thousands, what students did today in Tennessee is they went to the Tennessee State Capitol in Nashville. Look at these images. This is today. Now, you might have seen in the news last week that Thursday last week, a lot of kids in Nashville did the same. Last week, Tennessee kids crowded into the galleries overlooking the State House floor uh, calling for gun reforms. That was Thursday last week. Today, they rallied on the State Capitol steps in Nashville. Um, and then in huge numbers, they lined up, they went through security, and they just poured into the hallways of the state capitol, at one point mounting a kind of sit-in outside the offices of the Republican House Speaker. The same House Speaker today stripped um, two Democratic legislators of their committee assignments and threatened to expel three Democratic state legislatures from the state legislature altogether, threatening to throw them out of the state legislature because those three Democratic state legislators joined with the kids who protested from the galleries last week. Well, tonight, those kids are back at the state capitol, and joining them are apparently a bunch of parents who have their little kids in tow with them. Um, and apparently, they are planning to stay through this evening's legislative sessions in Nashville, at the state capitol in Tennessee. We're keeping eyes on Nashville tonight as, as that story continues to unfold. Just some remarkable images today out of Tennessee.